All right, look, you have to finish up. Get the segment under three minutes, do cuts, whatever, just get it done. I know I'm at rehearsal right now, I can't just leave. Okay, well, that's not my problem. I'm only helping you guys out because you are new. This is your segment, not mine. And by the way, this computer's on the fritz, so just watch out for that. No, no, this is totally unfair. You can't just do this. Okay, well, I can't maybe just keep important. babying you, Malia. You're babying me? Are you calling me a baby right now? Well, this maybe so I am, because you're, you're so, so impossible. impossible. Wait, what happened? Did we switch bodies? Stop that. It's dead. Okay, well, good. I can go now. No, no, the, the files aren't gone, obviously. You still need to edit. And you can't just go to rehearsal like me. They won't know who you are. Okay, well, I can't just not go. You'll go for me. What? I don't know if I can do this, Malia. I hate theater. You got this. It's all in the attitude. Thank you so much for teaching me your ways. Do you want to go outside for a second, get a breath of fresh air? Sure. We, we switched back. back! I don't have braces oh anymore. Oh my god. Oh. Oh. I'm gonna go to rehearsal now. Wait, what about the segment? Oh. I'm Josephine and I'm a co-vice president of the class of 2024. This week, the transcript talks to the feminist collective, looks into Freaky Friday, and investigates the TikTok ban. Hamped Up talks basketball, and Wheel of Courses looks into the plant science and food justice class. The transcript would like to wish a congratulations to Jasmine Fu, Shira Sweet, and Jane Harrison Millman for receiving honorable mentions in this year's C-SPAN Student Cam National Video Contest. On Wednesday, Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey announced that she would be issuing pardons to individuals that are charged with misdemeanor level possession of marijuana. These pardons could potentially be issued to hundreds of thousands of individuals, with Governor Healey stating that this is the most sweeping cannabis pardon announced by any governor in the United States. In other news, the city of Northampton has ordered Haymarket to cease all operations until the cafe can obtain a proper license. This order came within just a few weeks after the business announced that it was reopening. I'm Michael Torno, and thanks for watching. This month is Women's History Month, a national recognition and honor of women's contributions in American society. Despite having a month dedicated to celebrating women's history, the National Women's History Museum found that less than 25% of all historical figures covered in U.S. schools are women. At NHS, the Feminist Collective was created this school year as a place for everyone to discuss current social justice topics surrounding women's experience and be a safe space for all to join. 
This week, we talked to the NHS Feminist Collective about the importance of including and centering female figures in historical education and discussion and how that can be done in a more inclusive way. It's important to center female figures in history education because women are a huge part of history. So if you leave women out of history, you're leaving out this entire section of it, which you don't get the full story. And what can you learn if you don't have the full story? I think just it's impossible to really teach a good history class if you don't teach like women's history, because uh, women have been involved in like every major historical event since like the beginning of time. So I just feel like if you're excluding women from from narratives in history, it just it doesn't work. It's not a full story. Representation during Women's History Month is as like the same thing as like talking about women. Is just making people like, hey, this person has experience like similar things to what I've gone through, and making people not feel alone. I think that the the curriculum as it is uh, definitely includes women's stories, and uh, I think the issue is time. Setting aside just one month to share those stories, um, it. It doesn't make sense to me because these are stories that are woven into all histories and we need to talk about them all the time. When we're only given an, enough time to do, you know, the greatest hits or, you know, what people see as the most significant people and the most significant events, then, you know, the, the challenge is we're, of course, going to, you know, miss... Um, you know, miss important people in different experiences. And so I, I think to maybe not so much focus on, you know, unique women and, and um, you know, these exceptional women stories, uh, just to, you know, look through everything with that gendered lens. The Feminist Collective, which everyone should go to, is in room 205, which is Miss Stevely Hale's room, every other Thursday during Flex. If you're interested in learning more about the NHS Feminist Collective, follow them on Instagram at NHS Feminist Collective. Hi, I'm Malia, and welcome to another behind-the-scenes look at this year's musical, Freaky Friday. Opening night was yesterday at 7 p.m. in the NHS Auditorium, and there was an amazing turnout. If you didn't go see the show last night, don't worry, because there will be four more performances. Today, we will reveal what the final week of rehearsals was like for the cast and admire all of the hard work that was put into this musical to make this production possible. Uh, so I'm Eden Cates and I play Ellie Blake, but so if you know the premise of Freaky Friday, it's that the mom and the daughter switch bodies, so I spend most of the show as Catherine in Ellie's body. So I'm the opposite of that, where I am Catherine, so I play, at the beginning I'm Catherine, and then for most of the show I'm Ellie because of the switch. I think that this year actually everyone like locked in. Yeah, the songs this year are like really insanely hard and the harmonies are like super complex and everyone sounds really amazing. So that's really cool to know that it's like really difficult music and we're doing it really well. My favorite song to do is like by far O Biology because the dance is really fun. Um, and it, fits, it does fit my range really well so I like don't have to stress about it. Freaky Friday is a much different musical than others that we have directed. I'm excited to have the audience see a story that they think they know, but see it in its most modern iteration. The most recent version of Freaky Friday was in 2003. Teenagers weren't on social media yet. Cell phones were barely a thing. This play takes place in the modern day, in the era of social media, in the era of cell phones, and that the concept of social media and how we're viewed through technology is a key theme in the show. What? Come to Freaky Friday, NHSmusical.com. Buy your ticket. It's super cool and hype and awesome. Thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to support the theater production over the next few days.
On Wednesday, the House of Representatives passed a bill that will lead to a nationwide ban on TikTok. TikTok, which has over 150 million American users, skyrocketed to fame in 2018 after its predecessor, Musical.ly, in 2018, gaining even more followers with the pandemic. Since then, TikTok has been a staple in the growth of Gen Z, shaping its culture permanently. The bill is set to pass if its China-based ownership doesn't sell, as lawmakers are acting on concerns that the company's data mining is a national security threat. Today, we talked to students at NHS on how the possible TikTok ban could affect them and their peers. I think on average, I spend like an hour maybe on TikTok. 20 minutes a day to like an hour 15 if I'm really doing nothing and sitting on my but all week. Like an hour and 15 maybe. Oh, how long do I spend on TikTok a day? Probably like upwards of four hours. I think that TikTok and all other platforms like YouTube and Snapchat and Instagram all have like these short videos that are like a minute less. And I think it's affected people's like concentration. If it actually gets banned, because I feel like this has been a topic before, then I think it'll be a positive change. But I think that people are so used to it in their lives that it'll be weird. I mean, I think it's an easy distraction. I mean, obviously there's YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels and other short form content platforms. But overall, TikTok is definitely the most prevalent and it has the slideshow format, which other ones don't, which are kind of brain rot. Well, specifically with teenagers, we have a much shorter attention span. I think TikTok overall has just made us very like unfocused. I think it's just people that have gotten so used to TikTok. The ban does happen. They'll be like, oh, it's gone and kind of just turn to the other short form of content. But we've just gotten really used to TikTok. So I think it would be an adjustment. Well, when I think of like fashion as a trend, I think it's made it go like a lot quicker, if that makes sense. Things things are trending don't last as long. Well, I think TikTok impacted my life as a teenager in 2024 by saving me in every aspect. How do I think the upcoming TikTok ban will ruin the lives of teenagers and kids? <laughs> I think it will absolutely destroy the hearts and souls of this generation and it will leave an army of soulless husks to be controlled. As without TikTok, there's no free thought, there's no passion, and there's no love in the world anymore. My overall thoughts on this ban is that it's a draconian ban and that it is not based in any sort of logic or reason and it is a very, very big and obvious infringement of the First Amendment right to freedom of speech. Um, overall, I am not a fan of the TikTok ban and I will be avidly protesting in defense of TikTok. The bill now must go to the Senate, then the President before it is passed. Thank you for watching Culture Shock. Y'all ready for this? Hi, and welcome to Hamped Up. The boys and girls varsity basketball teams have recently moved to the MIAA tournaments, where they continued their season in a series of knockout rounds. The boys basketball team fell to Sharon, 54 to 65, while the girls continued to the final four. This week, we interviewed team members to take a closer look into their season and their accomplishments along the way. I think our team is a really good dynamic. It's super, everyone's super close and friendly and supports one another, which is really helpful, especially having a lot of underclassmen. It's really nice having like all the upperclassmen support them and be really nice to them and just everyone's great it's like a big family support one another and help one another when we're in like need help and stuff so I think it's awesome how close we are I think that we really have some great team chemistry and so it makes our team play better when everybody on the bench is cheering and when the starters are such good friends and can really really cheer with each other and play together yeah, there's a lot of great energy on our team. I mean, it is a lot of pressure, uh, especially like for the team, especially as a captain, you know, like not to let them down. But, you know, it brings out the best in us and we try to compete and stuff. So I think it I think it's great, the pressure. It's a lot of pressure, especially for the seniors, knowing that it could be your last game uh, to have a playoff game and especially in the state tournament. Yeah, uh, going away. To Sharon for our playoff game it was definitely um, you know their student section was a factor and just being in a new environment completely something you're not used to. For me my like pivotal point was probably my senior year I think that was the year I really started to really kind of unlock the new skills in basketball and kind of really understand the game and kind of um, solidify my play. Definitely making it to the Final Four was definitely the best moment in my season so far. Um, it was just so awesome being able to hold the trophy and take all the pictures with the team and the bus ride back, which was so fun. So, um, and being able to 
upset Walpole was just so fun. Our semifinals, um, we played Minichog, and it was just a really back and forth game, and it was super good and well played. Thanks for watching. Congrats to the boys and girls teams for playing so hard this season. Welcome back to Wheel of Courses, where we take a look into different classes and talk to the teachers and students who have taken the class before. Today we'll be looking into plant science and food justice to learn more about the workload and what the class has to offer. My favorite part of plant science and food justice would definitely be helping our student learners uh, get hands in the dirt and feel more empowered and able to start growing some of their own plants or vegetables at home after finishing the class. Something that's more challenging about plant science in food justice is that it is in part a science class. We're learning about the biology of plants and things plants need to be successful, but we're also um, using some of those biological needs to extrapolate and think more critically about social systems. It's a unique challenge for students in a science classroom to be thinking not only about scientific concepts, but about social issues and how those things relate together. We do a lot of project-based learning. We do a lot of um, growing during class. So we're up a lot. We're working with our hands. Um, and we're really trying to showcase the things that we're learning in important and meaningful ways. My favorite part of the class is Megan's energy. It's infectious. Whatever we're doing, she makes it really fun. And she's super patient. And we also just started growing cucumbers and we're gonna spend more time outside, which is really exciting. Um, something challenging about this class is probably like having to remember the different parts of plants and stuff, doing plant biology, that doesn't come super easy to me. I'm not really a STEM person, and we're gonna start doing like plant biology, which is probably gonna be difficult, but then we get to actually grow the plants, and that'll be really fun. My favorite part of plant science and food justice was just like learning how to plant things, because I love you know, plants and wildlife, I think they're, I think it's great. And I, yeah, I loved just like, our lectures were great. The course load was pretty light. It was very light. I um, really didn't spend more than a half an hour on work, not even every night. And most of the work I was able to get done in class, it was really manageable. The hardest part of the class was um, the beginning when it was still so cold out, but the plant room is really nice. So we were able to do stuff through that. I would 100% recommend the class. It's super engaging and fun, and there's just so many like hands-on activities that are just so great. Thanks for watching, and make sure to talk to Miss Murphy if you're interested in taking the class. Tune in next week to hear some more about courses. Thanks for watching. Make sure to stop by Bueno Isano on Monday, March 18th. 20% of proceeds go to the NHS Class of 2024. Just present the flyer on our Instagram at NHS Class of 24 for your dine in or pickup order. See you there.